Welcome to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We are so excited you're here. We're even more excited to have our guest, Yvonne Evers, founder and CEO of Succession App on because she's going to talk to us about, dare I say, kind of a scary topic for a lot of us, Yvonne, and that's board succession planning. And we start off with a question, does your nonprofit even do this? And I have a feeling most of us are going to be watching this show saying, no, we That's don't, right. but we need to. And so let's get on and have this, this conversation. You've probably noticed we've debuted a new group of co-hosts uh, co -host with us over the last several weeks. They are just rock stars from all over the country. And um, we're really excited to, to have you meet them and to hear more from them. Just a diverse group of people. And it's just been so much fun rolling them out. We also want to say thank you to all of our presenting sponsors. Without them, there would be no nonprofit show. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, mm -hmm. JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Okay, the woman of the hour, Yvonne Evers. Yvonne, I kind of met you, but I didn't. We were speaking at a conference in Maui in December. I saw your table and I was like, holy moly, I got to meet these folks. And then I went into the area where I was speaking. Um, and then I, I had some meetups with folks and I we never we never met physically, but I got your materials. And I was so intrigued with what you had going on. So tell us about your business and how you got started. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for reaching out. Um, yeah, that was a good conference in Maui. Um, not only because it was in Maui, but it was a really good conference. And you probably didn't see me because I had a lot of clients there and a lot of people who were interested in succession planning there yeah. as well. So. Um, my company succession app um, has been around lots of people think succession planning is something that's just fairly new <laughs> it's not we should have been thinking about this for a long time now so um i started it uh this the software rolled out in 2013 but my background is i was first um uh, an HR consultant, a compensation expert. And I dealt with small community-based hospitals, credit unions, and other for not nonprofit type companies, uh, service organizations. And then and I've served on a large credit union board for 20 years. And that's where it all started really for me, is back in like 2009, 2010, uh, the CEO and I were looking at our board. We had nine, nine board members. I'm not on the board now, I'm an emeritus director after 20 years. And we looked at our board and we said, oh, I think we're gonna have some turnover coming up. Maybe we should start planning for this. And at this point, everything was, I was thinking term limits maybe, or age limits or, should we do something like that? And we put um, a committee together and the committee decided, well, yeah, let's, let's see if the board will go for that. No, that wasn't what they wanted. So I came up with a process and a number of my other clients around the country wanted kind of the same thing. And so I came up with a process where you anticipate um, when you're gonna, people are gonna leave the board what competencies they have, what you should be looking for, that sort of thing. So I, and it was in Excel and Word. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gee, this might be nice to put into a software. So I hired a firm, got it going. Um, I have people who've been on the board succession since 2013. And then they said, the boards were like, can we use this for our CEO? And actually that's, it's a little bit different, obviously when you're doing the succession planning for a CEO. So we created a management module and then they wanted to use it for management levels below. So we created 
more security in there. And then it became, now it's high potential leader. And now we have one large credit union using it for um, a 360 assessment as well. So, so yeah, it, and I, so I focus on succession planning, have been since 2010, really, mm -hmm. and especially with the software since 2013. Also do executive coaching with a lot of um, executives. In my market, just so everybody's kind of aware, um, I work with credit unions is my main market, although I have a lot of other clients as well. But credit unions, as some of you may, may not know, are, are not for profit cooperatives. Right. So yeah, they do have to they do have to compete with banks, too. So yeah. they do have that aspect to them as well. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating thing because um, I have done work through the credit union sector as well. And a lot of it has to do with understanding next gen board members and board transition and all of the things that you talk about without having this structure and the fear that I see on um, the concern that I see needs your type of help because um, without a structure, it's just a lot of like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Kind of, you know, mentality. So talk to us about why this is a critical time in nonprofit succession planning. And maybe you're going to tell us this isn't the only time. I, I have a sense that you're going to say this isn't just the only time. This, the, this is not the only time. Um, it actually, the Pew Research Center did a study back in, I think it was 2009, and they said starting in 2010, and maybe a lot of you have heard this before, starting in 2010, about 10,000 people a day were turning 65. So we have this, what some people call a silver tsunami happening, and maybe, um, Julia, you noticed at the credit union conference that a lot of the people who were there were older, mm -hmm. you know, 60s, 70s, 80s as 80. well. Yeah. We see that we see that in the credit union movement. We see that, you know, sometimes I think we see it because um, a lot of like credit unions and nonprofits don't pay their board members. Right. And so yeah. and people get really committed to it. Like I love I love the credit union movement. People love the the organization, mm -hmm. the nonprofit that they're work, working with. Mm -hmm. And so they stay and they want to stay and they're committed. Mm -hmm. But this will continue probably into um, 20 to 2035 or, or a little bit longer. There will be an impact. And not only are we going to be losing our, our older board members, but the reason we need to plan, and I'll probably get into this a little later as well, is because when we get younger ones in, they're not gonna stay as longer. It's totally different than the commitment that a lot of board members had to their nonprofit mm -hmm. um, because they, they're busy. And so they're gonna stay maybe, you know, three to five years. Yeah. Um, whereas some, you know, like I stayed 20 years on our board. We had one board member who stayed 40, I think 42 years. There's a lot, lot of nonprofits that have long-term, long-term board members. You know, Yvonne, it's fascinating because I hear this a lot. And I, I know that when I was speaking at that conference, um, we had so many, I had so many board members that came up and said, oh, Julia, we need somebody like you to come on our board. And I was like, actually, no, you you know, I'm in my early 60s. You need to have passed me by and go on to the 50s and 40s. But that's just because they had an ecosystem of board members that were in their 80s that had been there, right. you know, institutionally for these, you know, major decades, to your point, incredibly committed totally believed in the mission, really was a part of their lives. But the reality was the stewardship needs to change. And and they were seeing it, but they hadn't done this work. And so um, I, I'm just going to call it out. 
there was a lot of fear, right? I mean, the people that were in my um, my lectures were were stressed. They were stressed. And so this leads me to the next question is, how do you thrive in a time of great change, especially in a fintech or financial environment where you're trying to, you know, communicate uh, conservative approaches and and sta stability and sustainable growth and all of these things that don't always jive with the thought of change. What do we do to kind of let everybody know we're going to be okay, we are okay, this is a part of growth, all of those messages? How do we do that? Well, I'm going to say that that we plan. Okay. But we also have to get our current board members who may be older to understand that while we're planning, we're not trying to push them out the door. That's what they think. That's what a lot of them think. When I'm working with boards on succession planning, one of the things I have to say right up front is just so you know, when we are doing this, we're not trying to get rid of you. We're trying to plan for the future. We're, when we are talking about the competencies we'd like represented on the board and we want you to do a self-assessment, we're not saying, oh, you don't have the right competencies or you haven't worked for a while, so we don't want you anymore. We're not trying to do that. So I can tell you at a different conference that I went to earlier in the year, we were there exhibiting and we actually had board members walk by older board members walk by and like give me the hand <laughs> like we're not we're not even thinking about it so the so the first thing is you have to make sure that your board members are open to it are open to planning they realize because some of them think that it's it's going to be okay it's going to be like you know Every time we've never had any problems in the past and that, that sort of thing. So um, I think the way, you know, first of all, recognition that we have to plan, but then actually doing the planning. When are people potentially leaving the board? When do they think they might be leaving? And, um, and then what competencies do they have? And what, what should we be looking for? And do we have enough diversity and when I talk about diversity, I'm not just talking about ethnicity, age and gender. I'm talking about everything. Like I have a client who is uh, wants to make sure they have military represented yeah. or a certain location um, that they're at. There's like I was reading an article one time in Inc. magazine and they were saying that they identified at one organization 38 different kinds of diversity. Mm -hmm. So there are, there, there's just tons of different diversity. Absolutely. But the other thing I want to say is an issue that's coming up more and more and more is not only leaving the board, but we are not always having people to lead the board or want to lead the board. And that's, that's part of our software as well as board leadership. And they tell us if they want to be on the, uh, in the leadership role. And a lot of them, you know, we'll get, we'll get the chart back. It'll say, no, it, there'll be a couple people. And then if we have organizations that do kind of a, a rotation annually, mm -hmm. um, and they make everyone be the chair, some point mm -hmm. some people don't want to be chair and they'll yeah. leave and then you lose a good board member right um, because of that it it's such a a big deal and especially i think um board members and i i'd love to get your feedback on this i think a lot of board members don't realize and i'm not just talking about credit unions i'm talking about all right. you know 501 c3 c6s um C sevens, they do not always understand the role of the fiduciary right. and how their name and address is going on that 990. And they are responsible for the actions, you know, legally that are taken on behalf of the organizations that they serve. And I feel like Yvonne, once they get that message or they, and generally it doesn't happen until something unfortunate has occurred, 
then there's a there's like a hesitancy to be even more forward and more leaning in because they're like, you know, I, I can't, I can't take on this burden. And um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I agree with you that they don't think about it enough. Yeah. And I, I'm afraid I like I, I hate to say it, but I do think that there are a number of people who don't even think of that. I think it's I think that we have to have and probably the executive director or the CEO needs to kind of head that and say and remind people have an attorney come in and remind people of their fiduciary responsibilities on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, you know. I know that a lot of people think oh we know we know what they are and why are we doing this again it's like the bank secrecy act for for you know financial institutions that you have to go through every year um but but i do think that some people do not understand really what what their role but what their role is yeah i agree and and i think it is uh, appalling because um it's you know it's all those those compliance issues, it's all the policy statements, it's all those things that boards need to be signing every year, recognizing, and I think a lot, A, don't do it. They don't they don't update those policies if they even have them. And then there's just this, this um, missing link about what the responsibility is. So it's an interesting question and it, it's got to factor into my next question, which is really about the impact and the communication aspect of this. I thought it was fascinating that you started started us off by saying a lot of board members fear that you're doing this to get rid of them. They they internalize it, if you will. Those are my words, not your words. But um, so how does communication factor into this? I, I think of this as like a PR thing. Well, I, I think it is important. Um, the communication is extremely important. And like I said, um, when you're starting this process, I think there's, I think more and more um, organizations are seeing that, that they need to do board succession planning. And well, in the credit union industry, the examiners, NCUA um, has, has now said, we, we want, we encourage that, we're looking for that. I mean, that's just what it is mm -hmm. just to protect. But in for communication, I think it's about reminding them they're extremely important and valuable mm -hmm. to the organization before you start the process that we're just planning. What what is the purpose? It's always, you know, like any good communication is the why. <laughs> and so yeah. tell them why. Why are we doing this? I, you know, when we, going back to my experience, when we, when the committee came up with, we actually had a policy written and I was presenting it at the next board meeting and board members were like, no, we're not going to no." the other board members who weren't on my committee. And um, so we had enough, we had the majority that we probably could have pushed it through, but I said, you know what, this is so important. And I don't want anybody to feel bad because when people are volunteering for nonprofit boards, thank you for your service because it's so important. And, you know, I value that. I thank people all the time when I see them mm -hmm. um, as board members. And so we don't want, want them to feel bad. And so we want to communicate like communicate why we're doing this. We're just planning for the future. We we want to, we also don't want, you know, like for, um, you know, the credit unions, the members to come in to the annual meeting and say, wow, we have an older board. Mm -hmm. And are we gonna have, what are we gonna have in the future? What's the plan? Right. And there are some sophisticated members who who come to the annual meetings who will ask questions like that. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing is you mentioned, you know, and we just touched on this lightly, but I mean, you know, from serving on a board, you don't show up your first meeting and you're good to go. 
Right. You need to be trained. And, and it's even if you've served on another board, you need to be trained up on the nomenclature, the culture, who the people are, their names, their jobs, you know, it's, it's not just to get somebody in and we're all good to go. This takes a period of time. And um, so there's a, a big piece of that that's missing, I think, if you don't plan, right? Because then you're kind of scrambling to fill something. Well, you know I have an example. Yeah. One of my clients called in a panic the other day and said, well, unfortunately, one of their board members um, passed away. And then uh, another one's ill. Mm -hmm. And then she found out that another one got so overwhelmed at work and said, I have to leave. And now there's some at risk that we we're looking at a board of seven going, well, now you might be down to two, which is that's a lot of people to find because people say it's really hard to recruit. And if you're not looking ahead um, and you wait, it may take a while for you to find the right people to come onto right. your board. Right. And, and, and that's the thing too, you know, you, you, you said the perfect thing. Let me um, kind of, we don't have a lot of time left and, and I think I could probably talk to you about this for days, but what are some succession planning tools and tips? Um, I love your software and just having gone on and looked at, at your site, but what are some things that maybe we need to be thinking about for mindset because I suspect for a lot of organizations, this is a, you mentioned, it's a frightening topic because it seems so personal, but how do we kind of get that ball rolling so that we're not doing it in crisis and we're doing it from a point of strength? You try, you know, if you have, a, I always say, when people call me and say, we want to do board succession planning, but we have some skeptical board members. <laughs> and I first will ask, how strong of a board chair do you have? Okay. Um, if the board chair is strong and can communicate that we need this for planning, if there's trust within the board, sometimes boards aren't don't have as much trust. I've dealt right. with a lot of those. You probably have too. Um, we want to make sure that they trust that this process is what what the purpose of the process is. And so if you can get some people on the board who know the value of it, that's, that's how you can get it, get it started. Um, and then in terms of like, really what you should be doing with board succession planning, whether you're using it, uh, a web tool like we have or not is you should be kind of having people anticipate when they might be leaving the board so that you don't have so much turnover at one time because that can create a lot of difficulties for the organization so, that's so are you I asking am. let me interrupt you are you are you talking about looking at that through the lens of board term limits or at, are you asking these people to self-declare like how do you figure that out if you you have you know, um, usually there, if there are term limits, you still might not have somebody staying for their whole, you know, true whole 12 or 15 years or whatever your term yeah. limits are. So what you want to do is from their point of view, what, you know, when might you be leaving the board? And when they say, well, if I'm still needed, if I'm still healthy and I say, no, we want you to pick a year. You can change it next year when we okay. update this. We're flexible. Maybe you have to leave sooner. Maybe you can stay longer. We also add, add that. Um, so it's from their point of view. Then they're a little bit more open to it. Mm -hmm. But I say we want to see, you know, we want to see overall where the organization is. Like, are we going to have a lot of turnover at one time? Um, and we also want them to self assess on competencies that the board would like to see. And we don't need everybody to have every competency. And mm -hmm. some of the competencies are critical, meaning we need to have them have one person have it at a advanced or expert level one. Um, the, you know, and 
so and there are some that we will want most a, a lot more to have but when are we going to have those gaps and what should we be looking for and are we all men or do we have just one woman and do we have to look for more females and or other diversity um so those are those are really important but also i mentioned board leadership because if you don't have anybody in your board who wants to be in board leadership the next recruit that you get in you need to make sure they've been in, in board leadership before right. um and just just one other thing i want to add is it's important to potentially what's becoming really common now are associate or board member in training people mm -hmm. yeah. so that you can like you said you were saying earlier that it takes people a while to get to know yeah. the organization yeah. it takes two to four years for them to feel comfortable mm -hmm. um, depending upon how complex your nonprofit is so if you can get somebody in as an associate now an associate means they don't get to vote but they hear everything they know what the decisions are that they would have to make as a regular board member so so that's another um kind of tool you can use i love that and i think that's just genius because you're right about this time and then you know when people can't meet the expectations they get frustrated the organization gets frustrated and um it leads to, you know, a potential loss of talent. Yvonne Evers, founder and CEO of Succession App. Wow, what a great conversation. I'm really glad that I got to see, I didn't get to meet you, but I got to see your table yeah. in, in Maui in December, um, because this has been a fascinating conversation and one that we certainly need to be having more of. Um, check out successionapp.com and you'll get to see all the different ways that Yvonne and her team navigate this complex issue. And I love that you're also doing management succession. I think yes. that's amazing. And I, I applaud you for that because um, that is a huge, that's a missing link for so many organizations. Um, again, we have amazing sponsors that guide us um, through these, these conversations in so many ways. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Um, Yvonne, we end every day with this message, and it, it, today it means something different like it does many days to me. And the message is this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks so much for joining us, Yvonne. I'm sure we'll be talking to you again.